Well, have you ever gone through the process of buying a house? Yes. It can be a challenge, especially if you have a big family and everybody has their opinions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's got an amen back here. Some family members like new homes and others like old houses with lots of character. Some like move in ready and others like fixer uppers. And I find it interesting that in most married couples, there's usually one move in ready and one fixer upper, which makes some really lively conversations. And there are advantages to all of these approaches to buying or making a home. Our scripture readings for today are kind of like house building stories in a way that the story from Acts is kind of like renovations on an old house. And the story from Revelation is like the building of a new move in ready house. But in both cases, God is making things all th making all things new. So let's take a look at each of these. In our reading from Acts, we hear Pe Peter defending himself to the apostles and the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And as often happens, our passage starts in mid-story, so we have to kind of back up and, and, and look at what happened before. What happened was, and what Peter was explaining to the leaders in Jerusalem, is that Peter had a vision one day in which God said to him three times, what God has made clean, you must not call profane, or what God has called right, you must not call not right. Peter was still puzzling over this vision when three men came to the house where he was staying from a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Now Cornelius, being a centurion, was a commander of a hundred soldiers. And he was also a God-fearing man. That is, he believed in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of the Old Testament. And as a result, he was good to the Jewish people. He did not use his position, um, even though the Romans had, had conquered Israel, he did not use that position to take advantage. The Apostle Luke says that he was well spoken of by the entire Jewish nation. And so Peter goes with these men to Cornelius' house where Cornelius tells him that he saw an angel. And the angel said, send for Peter because he has a message to share with you and you need to hear it. So Cornelius gathered his family and all his friends together. He got a house full of people and he had a large house, a house full of people. And they listened to Peter talk about Jesus. And Peter told them about Jesus' miracles and about Jesus' teaching, how he taught God's word and how he told them how Jesus was crucified but rose from the dead three days later. And he was seen by many people. And Peter says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And Cornelius and his family believed Peter's message. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on them in power and they began to speak in tongues and praise God. And seeing this, Peter realized as he says, now I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. At which point Peter baptized Cornelius and all of his family into the church. What's so extraordinary about this, as the reading mentioned, is that up till this point, the vast majority of Jesus' followers were Jewish. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He taught the Jewish faith. The disciples were all Jewish, and Jews and Gentiles didn't mix with each other. Jews did not eat with Gentiles, did not go into their homes. And now all of a sudden, Peter not only goes into the home of a Gentile, but shares the gospel with them, baptizes them, and then stays with them for a few days, which would have involved eating with them, which would have been completely against everything that the Jews believed in at that time. So how did this come about? How did this happen? I mean, was it God's plan for Jews and Gentiles to be so separate from each other? No, not exactly. Anyway, God does warn the Jewish people in the Old Testament not to worship the gods of other nations. And God warns the Israelites not to marry outside the faith, otherwise God's people will be tempted by their spouses to go worship other gods. But God did not choose the Jewish people so that they could become an exclusive club. That was not the intention. God's plan was always for God's people to reach out with God's word to all races and all nations. God said to Abraham, the founder of the, of the Jewish nation, through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So Israel was supposed to be a sign 
that pointed people to God. And sometimes they were. Sometimes we see Gentiles in the Old Testament, people like, like Ruth and like Job, who came to faith and lived as God-fearing people. But a lot of times that didn't happen. A lot of times the religious leaders in particular turned inwards and they made all kinds of rules for people to follow, what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. And it became all about religious tradition and not about faith in God and outreach to the nations. And Jesus criticized the religious leaders of the day for exactly this. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. He said things like, you give 10% of your, of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, and you've neglected the weightier matters like justice and mercy and faith. Blind guides, he said. You strain out gnats and swallow camels. So it was always God's intention to include the Gentiles in God's plan of salvation. And God got that message across to Peter by saying, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And when Peter told all of this to the leaders of the Christian church in Jerusalem, they were satisfied that this message was from God. And it ushered in the era of the New Covenant, the New Testament. This is the beginning of the New Testament era. Now, for the first time, all the obstacles were cleared away that prevented non-Jews from believing in the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What had concerned the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem was the question, has Peter compromised the one true faith in the one true God? And their answer was no, he did not. Because God had declared Cornelius and his family pure by Jewish standards, even though they were Gentiles. And God gave them a sign to prove it. Cornelius and his family received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, just like the disciples did at the very first Pentecost. Now I need to make a little side note at this point because this particular passage is one of those hot button proof texts that some people try to use to prove that a person has to speak in tongues in order to be a Christian. The argument goes something like this, that all believers receive the Holy Spirit, which is true. And when Cornelius and his family believed in Jesus, they received the Holy Spirit and immediately spoke in tongues and the disciples spoke in tongues. Therefore, all the people who believe in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit must speak in tongues. This is a misreading of the scriptures. And it's as far off the meaning as those who claim the opposite, who say the gifts no longer exist. Both extremes are mistaken. The Holy Spirit gives different gifts to different people as God wills it. And that still happens today. But there are no set rules as to who gets what gifts and why and when. For those who are interested in learning more about the gifts of the Spirit, I recommend to you reading 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13 where Paul talks about the various gifts and how God uses them. Second sidebar at this point too, this same passage has also been used by some to teach universal salvation, the, the idea that because Jesus died for the whole world, everyone in the world's going to be saved. The passage says, what God has made clean, you shall not call unclean. And this applies to all people everywhere. But the passage does not do away with free will. All people are called to believe in Jesus Christ and to turn our lives over to the direction of the Holy Spirit. But not all people choose to answer that call. God does not force salvation on anyone. Look at what happened with Cornelius in this example. God reached out to Cornelius. God sent a vision through an angel. So God started the whole process. Cornelius believed what the angel said and did what the angel said to do, but he could have just said, eh, whatever, and went on with his day. Cornelius chose to listen to the angel and send for Peter, and he listened to Peter, and then when Peter said that everyone who believes in him and forgives, receives forgiveness through Jesus' name, Cornelius believed, and that's when the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit is not like the force in Star Wars that is in all things and through all things, right? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God, 
within us. It's impossible to know God in any way apart from faith. The Apostle Paul writes, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And the Apostle James, Jesus' brother, writes, just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So to have faith is to change direction of our lives and, and not everyone chooses to do that. So getting back to our original thought then, God is making all things new. God is adding on to the house that the family of God has lived in up to this point. Where there was once a Jewish temple, now there's a whole Gentile wing on the house. There's God's mansion has been expanded, which was always part of the plan. So now this new creation is underway. There are three things I'd like us to see today. First off, there's a new covenant. Jesus calls it the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. The old covenant was given through the law, through Moses, and the new covenant is given through Jesus Christ. Secondly, there's a new temple. The old te Jewish temple was destroyed when Jerusalem fell in the year 70 AD, and it was never rebuilt. The new temple where God dwells is in God's people through the Holy Spirit in each of us. The Apostle Paul writes, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. In very real terms, this means that whatever someone does to our bodies, whatever we do to our bodies, whatever someone else does to our bodies, they do to God, because our bodies are God's temple. And so I point this out just in case in a congregation this size, there, there's usually someone or more than one someone who has seen physical violence, has witnessed it, has experienced it. Know that God is in you and not, he's not out there somewhere watching. God is in you and with you, walking through this life with you. And God will deal with people who mess with his temple. Third thing, since we have a new temple, our bodies, we now have new sacrifices. In the old temple, they sacrificed animals. In the new temple, our sacrifice is praise and thanksgiving. And that's why we come to worship and sing songs and pray together. That's why we celebrate communion together. That's why we minister to the community together. Our sacrifice is praise and thanksgiving. And one other thing, God now has a new way of speaking to God's people. The old order of priests and prophets as go-betweens between God and us has passed away. And yes, there are still priests, and yes, there are still prophets, but the people of God don't need an intermediary anymore. Now we have the priesthood of all believers. Direct contact from God to God's people. We pray directly to God and not through a priest. And we have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, like we saw in the story of Cornelius, where God gives gifts to God's people directly. So it's new covenant, new temple, new sacrifices, and then a fourth one, a new way of communicating with God. There's a fifth new thing still on the way, which is, comes from the reading from Revelation. And that new thing is not going to be just a new wing on the house. This is going to be a whole new house. A move-in ready mansion, a new heaven and a new earth, John says. The old earth and everything else will pass away and all will be made new. It's so hard to imagine what that new heaven and new earth are going to be like. And the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about it. But what we do say, we do know some things. We know that God will be there. And we know God's people will be there. All the people we've read about in the Bible, all the people of faith that have come before us, all our relatives and friends and um, all the people of faith who will come after us will all be there. There will be no evil people in this place. There will be no death, no illness, no addictions, no injuries, no pain, we won't have to spend our days working at jobs that wear us down or slog our way through office politics just in order to put food on the table. And don't get me wrong, I do think there's going to be work to do in heaven, but it's going to be work that we like, work that we enjoy, work that's a pleasure. 
I'm hoping my work will include taking care of cats. <laughs> and I've already put in my application for the Celestial Choir. <laughs> the Apostle John tells us the new Jerusalem, the city of God, will be adorned like a bride for her husband. It will be a city of brilliant colors and sunlight with gates made of gemstones and streets made of gold. And the best thing of all is God himself will be with them and it says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine that? Every pain and every struggle we've gone through, not forgotten, but healed by the touch of God's hand. John writes, the one seated on the throne says, see, I am making all things new. These words are trustworthy and true. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen.